Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. And we're very sorry for the late start today, a little bit of miscommunication on the timing. But our guest today is worth the wait. It should be a fascinating conversation about uh, his recent book and observations about things that are going on uh, in the country. But SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we launched during this work from home period uh, that are interviews with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do is replicate the experience that we provide at our global conference series, the SALT Conference. And that's to you know, provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts for our audience, as well as to provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Kurt Anderson to SALT Talks. Uh, Kurt is the best-selling author of a number of books, including several novels as well as nonfiction books. Among his novels are Heyday, uh, Turn of the Century, and True Believers. And his most recent nonfiction book, which we're going to talk about a lot today, is called Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America. Uh, he contributes to the Vanity Fair and New York Times and was the host and co-creator of Studio 360, uh, the Peabody award-winning public radio show and podcast. He also writes for television, film, and the stage. He also co-founded Spy Magazine uh, and served as editor-in-chief of New York and was a cultural columnist and critic for Time and uh, The New Yorker. A reminder, if you have any questions for Kurt during today's SALT talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And now I'll turn it over to Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm, as well as the chairman of SALT uh, to, to conduct today's interview. Take it away, Anthony. Well, first of all, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, I loved your book. I, before we go into the book, though, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, professional background, your personal background. Uh, it's a little cliche, but I ask everybody this, and I always learn something. As an example, yesterday or two days ago, John Brennan, the CIA director, uh, he told us that he wanted to be the first American pope and that his name that he had designated for himself when he was 14 was Owen the First which was his family's, his, his mom's maiden name. So, I mean, I thought there's no way we're going to find that out, Kurt, on Wikipedia. So tell us something about your life uh, that sort of triggered you to go in the direction that you went in with your career or something fun about you that we couldn't find on the web. Well, I really started doing what I was doing as a, as a junior high school student in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I, I got a job on the uh, student newspaper, Arbor Heights Junior High School. And, and started, I guess, being a journalist of sort, but really writing uh, satire. I, I, that was my, my first uh, quasi-professional uh, writing experience, and I loved it. And, and, they let, and they let me keep doing it. They let me get away with it uh, through high school as well. And then I went to Harvard and, and was on the Harvard Lampoon there. That you could find on Wikipedia. But, it, but really, uh, even though I have done legit journalism in these and now write novels and history books, really ha having that uh, founding uh, uh, self tutorial in, in making mischief, uh, I guess was the beginning uh, of, 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 my, of my writing life. Right, and you were also uh, the, one of the founding editors of Spy Magazine with Graydon Carter. And so I wanna, I wanna go back to that moment in time uh, it was the roaring 80s. I yeah. was a prolific reader of Spy Magazine, as was everybody that lived here in New York. Uh, and you had Donald Trump on the cover once in a while, didn't you? Or what was we, we did have him on the cover once in a while. In fact, our first issue of Spy Magazine in October of 1986, uh, the cover story, it was called Jerks, the 10 Most Annoying New Yorkers, of whom <laughs> uh, uh, Donald Trump was one of them, uh, and in his the little write-up we did on him among the 10, he was just one of 10 at that point, um, he, he was uh, saying that he could solve the uh, nuclear missile uh, issue with the Soviet Union, just send him over there, he could learn everything he needed to know in an hour about nuclear missiles, was his quote in the first issue of Spy Magazine. So yeah, we kept at him, I, I investigated his bankruptcies and his bullying and all, all that he was then and remains. Who was the number one jerk? Did you have a ranking? Or we didn't, you know, I mean, ranking is the kind of thing we did. We didn't do it in that case. So he was just one of 10, along with Leona Helmsley and a lot of others. Okay, yeah, well, there you go. Well, we're really going back. All right, well, let's, let's turn our attention to your book, Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America. 
Uh, and basically, for our viewers that haven't listened to uh, read the book or listened to it on the uh, on, on Audible, it's a fascinating discussion about the U.S. economic system and how it unfortunately was re-engineered. Let's call it about 40 years ago to benefit elites. And uh, so we had something going on. And I don't know if you've read America Amnesia. But that was written about uh, in 2016. If you haven't, I'll send oh. you a copy of it. Okay. It basically said that we had this pretty good intersection between our government helping middle and lower middle income people through government activism and programs. And we had a pretty robust capitalist story going on in conjunction with that. We seem to have let jettisoned one part of that uh, about 40 years ago. We'll call it the Reagan Revolution. And now, as a result of which, the income uh, divide is widening even deeper. I'd like you to address that for our listeners. Explain why you wrote the book. Explain what you have seen uh, in our zeitgeist economically over the last 40 years. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I'd written, I'd, I'd t- taken a pause from writing novels uh, to write this previous book called Fantasyland that was about what I'd noticed really in the last in this century, right, in the last 15 or 20 years, uh, which is to say how the belief in the untrue of all sorts, uh, believe whatever you want, had become, had gotten out of control in this country. And so th- that book was an attempt to figure out how that had happened. And I figured out that it was uh, really deep in our bloodstream, uh, but, it, but it was under control. It was, a, it was an okay balance for a few hundred years, right? Because the grownups, when push came to shove, were in charge. But then I realized as that book came out and I went out and talked about it, that that was really only half the story, that, that this inequality and economic insecurity and the sense of hopelessness and less upward mobility, all that economic stuff uh, was the other half of how we got into the ditch or the ditches we're in. And how, how did that happen? And I realized because I was doing pretty well in the 80s and 90s, you know, as a journalist, as a magazine editor, as an entrepreneur, as all kinds of things. And, and which, uh, while I was voting Democratic and I considered myself a liberal, I, I, I was a little oblivious to and indifferent to the systemic change in the economy that had happened around, in, starting in the 70s, really. And I, in, this, in Evil Geniuses, I traced back to how, yeah, Reagan got elected and, wow, that's, that's new. And taxes on the well-to-do were cut in half or more as they were on big business. That's a big deal, but I didn't realize until I went back and did the did the research how the, the that had been n- not the beginning, but but the end of a decade of strategic work of CEOs and rich billionaires and libertarians and all these different people working in all these different ways to do what they did, as as you say, to re-engineer the system, to hijack the system, really, and to change it from this great kind of post New Deal. America that had worked for everybody. The rich got rich. The middle class got more prosperous. The working class were doing okay. This system was working. You know, all the boats were rising economically pretty well together. And then it changed. And 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 what I realized too during the research for this book is that, you know, inequality increased elsewhere, right? Globalization happened everywhere. Uh, technology changed the nature of economies in all the rich world. But, all, but in the U.S., we did this different thing of, of saying, no, all boats are not going to rise anymore. Your boats, you 80% of less wealthy people, are just not going to rise anymore. Your, your incomes and your, your household wealth is not going to increase. And that didn't just happen by accident. It happened by a whole series of regulatory changes, changes in thinking, changes in norms, changes in laws, changes in taxes that, that have left 80% of us not better off than we were 40 years ago. Uh, And it's a brilliant exposition. In addition to what you're saying right now, what you write in the book, you really lay out what happened in the convergence of a lot of special interests that sort of uh, uh, allowed for this outcome to happen. I was dying to ask you this when I was reading your book. So now I've got the opportunity to to, to ask it to you here. Uh, Isn't it the fault of the politicians though? Isn't it the fault of our public servants in a sense that they almost abided to special interests through the political lobbying, the payments, the junkets, the packs that were formed to help them stay in power. And they sort of lost that noblesse oblige, if you will, or that 
understanding that they were there to serve the American people, which included all the American people, not just necessarily the people that were donating to them? Certainly, they have their large share of the blame, um, at, along with, you know, uh, and, and the Democratic politicians do, as well as the, the, the Republican politicians who were more unapologetically and shamelessly devoted to this change. But so, so but there, there's plenty of blame to go around. But, um, you know, it really, what, what, you know, and it's easy to blame politicians, but we're used to blaming politicians, but, and, and there are political figures who are among my evil geniuses, but I think it's important to look at the whole realm of people, including CEOs, including intellectuals, including people in the media, uh, who, who, who did all that they had to do in various ways or failed to do what they had to do in the case of Democrats, I would say, to stand up and say, no, this is not, this is a raw deal. This is no longer the new deal. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, uh, but I think as I try to lay out in the book, in so many ways, the 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 zeitgeist, the the set of norms about what was fair, really just what was fair, were being changed on so many fronts. And so, partly out of earnestness, neoliberal Democrats said, "Yeah, maybe we should go halfway. Maybe we're all the free market is pretty good." And then kept kept basically lost their distinct vision of this sense of of fairness and and went along with the crushing of labor unions and went along with the end essentially of, of overtime pay, went along with reducing the minimum wage, all those things. And, and, and pretty soon there was, you know, there were, since there were no actual liberal Republicans anymore, there were the Democrats on economics took the place of liberal Republicans. Everybody was a Republican. The Democrats were just a little softer. Yeah, it's very, it's very compelling stuff. You, you write about technology in the book, about how it's exacerbated inequality, created more insecurity. I'd like you to address that, but then also, how can technology fix some of this inequality as well? It's sort of an interesting thing. It, it's hurt us in one way, but it may be able to help us. You explain it. I'd like you to articulate it here. Right. Well, I mean, as I, in my first couple of chapters are a kind of quick history of 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 modern capitalism of America of, and of technology and how technology has been key to prosperity again and again and again. But technology can be good, it can be bad. It can make nuclear weapons, it can make you know, nuclear power, it can, it can make life easier or it can, make, uh, it can make, make slavery worse through the cotton gin. It, you know, it's, it's the choices, it's the political, public, social choices that are made about how to use it. So. Technology, you know, we, we move from farms to factories, from factories to offices. Te technological change, good, used well. With this whole set of, of balancing mechanisms through government, through citizens' organizations, through unions, all the rest, there needs to be this balanced system. In the 1970s and 80s, we lost that balance. So, uh, you know, it, it became simply fine for companies to lay off as many people as they could constantly as a kind of way to do business, right? So sooner or later, that catches up with you as it has caught up with us. There aren't enough decent paying jobs for human beings, and that is going to become a bigger and bigger problem as AI kicks into gear and, and makes fewer and fewer jobs necessary. How do you deal with that? So we can have a future that is more like, you know, a utopia, frankly, where, where machines do all the work, but we got to figure out how to then share that bounty. And it's not just, it doesn't, it can't all go to Mark Zuckerberg and, and the investor class, you know? I mean, we are, we all did it together. I mean, by the way, as you know, I talk about in the book how the United States government was key, is key to building, doing all kinds of of making all kinds of businesses happen, including the internet and all of its businesses. Absolutely. Do we as citizens, uh, <laughs> taxpayers, get anything out of that? We do not. So, so there is a social wealth that has that has been created. That in with all with nanotechnology, with AI, all that it can get even more fantastically prosperous. But it's not going to work if just the rich are getting richer and just the people who own the machines and the AI. Our benefit. 
Well, you know, we're in agreement. I, there's another famous author, Malcolm Gladwell, once wrote, I think it was in one of his pieces. I, don't, I didn't remember seeing it in his book, but he said that he felt that this proliferation of greed at the corporate level started with baseball free agency in 1974. He attributed it to Kurt Flood. <laughs> and he basically said what happened was Kurt Flood got his free agency. The court said he could be a free agent. Then you had the rise of Reggie Jackson, and uh, Reggie's a friend of mine. He always laments that he got a five-year deal, which was $600,000 a year at the time. It was a stupendous contract. And obviously, you have Pat Mahomes now getting a half a billion dollar deal from the Kansas City Chiefs. And, and Malcolm's point was once the sports athletes could make $25, $50 million a year, American CEOs said, well, wait a minute. I'm doing a way harder job than them. What am I chopped liver? They went to their boards and said, pay me more money. Uh, and you saw this whole proliferation. And so I guess the question I have is, what is the counterdote to that? What, what, what could happen in the society to make people recognize, well, wait a minute, you got to look out for the little guy. Or wait a minute, your compensation on a multiple of your poorest employee is just too high. You know, I know yeah. you want to compete for art at Sotheby's and have a big aircraft, but you may want to take care of these people because if your neighbor's doing better, there'll be less social unrest. There's, there's a public good to that for your family as well. A hundred percent. Well, so a lot of things have to happen. And, and one of the bits of the pieces of hopefulness that I take from this book and doing the work is that it changed, right? We, were, we had this new deal all in the same boat, a sense of common good, even as, you know, the rich got rich and, you know, that we've always had an unequal society economically and no doubt always will. But this question of extremes and, and, and how ostentatious you, one feels sh no shame about being in, in having and showing off wealth while most people have had no income increases, can't afford college and all the rest. So there's the are we good people? Are we fair people? Or is greed good and profits all that matter? That's the question. It changed. That was changed 40 and 50 years ago. It can be changed again in through various ways. And, and to your point about the CEOs and, and earning multiples of their average workers, you know, that wasn't a law. It just was the, the norm that for decades and decades, uh, the average CEO got 50 or 60 times the, the pay of his uh, average worker. And that was a lot of money. Then, then it, you know, it, it okay, fine. In the eighties, it goes up to a hundred times. But then, in the nineties, to 300, 400, 500, a thousand times as much money. Tell me that isn't. <laughs> tell me that's fair. And 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 it, and it wasn't just the market working its way, as we know. And as I discovered, really, when I did the work and talked to people in finance, and 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 journalists and authors in finance, that 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 the pay that CEOs get. Uh, is not some kind of free market. You know, it is this clubby cabal that decides, as you say, because Kurt Flood or Reggie Jackson are getting what they're paying, like, hey, why aren't I getting paid this money? So so how does it, how do you fix that? By by preaching <laughs> the, the 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 injustice and fairness. But I also think, just as Franklin Roosevelt 75 years ago understood, like, wait, rich guys like me and us. Can, this system, this golden goose isn't going to keep laying golden eggs for us if if the people uh, in, in the Keynesian way aren't buying stuff to make it all work, right? The system needs a, a prosperous middle class to work. And, and, and I'm afraid that not only has the way we've changed the system 40 years not doing that, it's just going to get worse as more and more jobs become automated. Yeah, and, and I've, I've made this case. I think you and I share our level of moderation. I may, I have made the case to my friends that, well, you want to live in a Bob wire security compound in your McMansion while your fellow neighbors suffering? Or do you want to figure out a way to help people uh, stem the inequality? This way they don't come after you with a pitchfork or a tiki torch at some point, yeah. which will happen because yeah. it has happened throughout civilization. So I wanna, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, uh, audience participants. We're getting a lot of audience questions, but I, I have just two more questions for you, and they're tied to your other books because you seem to have a knack for seeing things before other people see them and a knack for 
understanding what's going on. And so you wrote a bestseller in the year 2000. It was called The Turn of the Century. And uh, for some reason, before the iPhone and Facebook, Kurt, you predicted what America was going to look like in 2020. You captured a lot of elements of our media, a lot of elements of what it would take to be successful in politics in terms of bombast and over-exaggeration. Uh, tell us tell us how you did that. Tell us what you saw back then and and what, why did it come true? And what do you see over the next 20 years? Well, uh, that was my first novel, actually. It came out in 1999. And, uh, and, and, and I've looked back at it fairly recently and, and I pat myself on my back because it did, it did sort of see the future in, in some ways uh, pretty clearly. I don't know. You know, in that case, because it wasn't a nonfiction book and I hadn't written a big nonfiction book, although I'd been a magazine writer and a magazine editor, I think because it was fiction, and, and this kind of near future fiction, it allowed me to sort of uh, tune into my instincts and intuitions in a way that if I were writing a serious piece of journalism, I, I, I wouldn't have allowed myself to do. So, uh, you know, it was it was this funny, it was this interesting time where, where again, I, I saw things happening. I saw how, uh, you know, in a way that hadn't been true in my younger life, how, how, how money was everything and how, and how this, uh, the, this blurring of distinctions between fiction and reality was was like just becoming a real problem, uh, 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 you know, and 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 on and on. So I was able to piece it together, I think, in fiction by depicting again the present and near future in a way that uh, uh, that, that, that writing writing speculative fiction allowed me to do. Then I think with with this you know, last big nonfiction book, Fantasyland, and then with Evil Geniuses as well, I, I, I really took what I learned to some degree as a novelist, sort of telling stories and seeing the big picture rather than, and, and, and focusing on small facts and details and figures as well, but seeing the big picture in a kind of novelistic way that I hope I bring to, to these nonfiction histories as well. Well, in Fantasyland, you wrote that in another bestseller, you wrote that in 2017, you said something fascinating about America. You said that the society has a peculiar susceptibility to falsehoods and illusions. Tell us why you feel that way. It's obviously true. I just want to understand why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, see, I didn't know. I mean, I, again, both of these books begin with a question of like, evil geniuses, how did things get so screwed up and insecure and unfair economically? And that one was, how did, how did that happen? And how old of a thing was that? And so I just began you know, some years of research and, and, and it really is, it's not unique to America, but it is so definingly present in America. It is so deeply part of our character. I realized when it wasn't just a thing that had happened, you know, since the, since the internet at first, I thought, Oh, maybe it's the internet helped that. And it certainly God knows did. And then I thought, Oh, it's the late sixties and seventies where you, everybody could do their own thing and find their own truth. And, and yep, that's part of it too. But then I just kept tracing the threads back in time and saw that literally from the first European settlers where they were coming here because it was going to be the new Jerusalem and or they were going to find gold in the dirt in Virginia like again it was well, none, neither of those turned out to be true but that they Americans self-selected to to believe that Americans self-selected to believe in advertising, right? Okay. The big the first big global advertising campaign was to get settlers to come to these money-making colonies, and and uh, and downplay the, the the harsh realities of that. So, and and the and because we are and always were such a such a uh, uniquely religious place. That in its extreme forms also led us to like believe things that aren't necessarily true. Um, our 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 knack for entertainment, and and then as entertainment become more and more extraordinary in Hollywood and movies and television, the, again that helped blur this this our sense of I think the real and the fictional in a way that again isn't unique to Americans, but my God is 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 part of our defining quality. So. On and on and on. Grown ups, you know, it was it was it was a thing in balance, and and the the you know serious people and experts and people who knew what they were doing, you know, were still in charge. And then that that establishment control started in all kinds of ways. 
started going out of control in the 1970s. And, uh, and you know, I, I, Fantasyland, I, I, I finished uh, before Donald Trump was nominated for president. Uh, it came out right after he was elected president. And he wouldn't have been in that book, probably. Probably wouldn't have been mentioned if he hadn't run for president. But then, just as I'm sort of writing this eccentric history of America, here he comes, sort of embodying every theme in that book, Fantasyland. And so uh, one of the small silver linings personally was that he, he illustrated this uh, theory of how America had gone to hell uh, that I wrote without him uh, being even present in the thinking or Man, execution it's, of it's, that book. It's, it's amazing. I'm gonna turn it over to John. We've got a ton of uh, audience uh, questions. Uh, the book, Evil Genius is the Unmaking of America uh, probably one of the best books I read this summer. I did a lot of reading in, in the pandemic. I appreciate so congrat that. Thank you. Congratulations on the book. But before I turn it over to John, just quickly, what do you? What's on your nightstand? What are you reading, sir? Oh, I am reading. What did I? I just read a book called Milltown um, about this a town in in Maine uh, that uh, and by a working class woman who who grew up there and 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 how that town has been effectively torn asunder by the very things I'm talking about. It's sort of a, a micro version of, of okay, evil geniuses in that way. Um, uh, that's that's the book I'm in the middle of. I, I just just started Anne Applebaum's The Twilight of Democracy. So yeah, I'm, read I'm reading happy, uh, yeah. uh, uplifting uh, books. Well, if, you know, if you know Anne, I just finished her book. If you know her, I uh, reach out to her for me. I'd love to get her on one of these things. I think she's fascinating. She wrote quite a book. That's a very... I won't ruin the ending there, but uh, it, it's a great yeah. book. Okay, John, fire out those questions. We got a ton of audience participation. John is working from the new Salt Studio, so he's sparing you his ancestors. He's a big time wasp, and so he's got like, you know, I don't know, white wigged people in his background. So he's sparing you that today. Go ahead. Go ignore ahead, his antics, Kurt. But um, you argue in the book uh, that we've gone back to sort of a pre-New Deal world order, and that's a theme that we've had a few speakers that have touched upon during SALT Talks, one of which was Daniel Okrent, uh, who wrote The Guarded Gate, which you might have read. So, you know, if we're in a pre-New Deal world order, we obviously need a New Deal to get us out of it. What, in your view, does that New Deal need to look like, you know, if we can get a, a more progressive president uh, into office? What do we need to do to jumpstart, you know, our climb out of the current uh, morose. Yeah. And and I just want to make the point that it's not, in my view, a world order. We we are we are exceptional in the world. Uh, right. So in, in, in these ways. But, I, you know, so the, the, I lo I've always loved the line, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And and so we can't say, oh, we we need this thing exactly like we did it in the New Deal. And we did this thing exactly like we did it in the New Deal. But the idea of the New Deal, that there was a there's an essential place for the government and society in general to make make the free market economy uh, more fair, more more you know uh, legitimate, more trusted, all those things in all kinds of ways, whether it's antitrust enforcement or or so forth, are important. But nineteen you know twenty twenty is obviously a very different time than 1932 or 1936. And, 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 and not least in the way that, as John Maynard Keynes saw it back in the 1930s, technology and machines are changing the nature of work in, these, in this profound way that I don't think is going to be like, is going to be sort of, it'll just sort itself out, like things sorted themselves out during the 20th and 19th centuries when during the previous industrial revolutions. So you got to have things on the table like a universal basic income. You know, I, I you know, Andrew Yang was never going to be elected, nominated, let alone elected president, probably. But the fact that he so intelligently had this particular critique of what was problematic about our economy, which is to say, not enough decently paying jobs uh, for enough human beings because of the miracles of technology and how are we gonna deal with that. that? That in all of its, however we do end up dealing with it needs to be on the table as you know, all kinds of people, Mark Zuckerberg for instance, and others in Silicon Valley uh, have, have signed off on. So that's one way. But first, I mean, we, we, we just 
we need to re, uh, re uh, convince ourselves, relearn the necessity and virtues of having a, a, a social understanding that, that we need to, everybody needs to come along if, if, if we're going to get to the promised land. And not just because it's good and it's fair and it used to work great. And from 1945 to 1980, it worked fantastically. Um, uh, that, but it, but the, the system is just not going to work. I mean, FDR was called a socialist in 1932 and 1936, and he saved American capitalism from its greed and from its excesses and from, from, from its, its misguidedness. And again, as his cousin Teddy Roosevelt had begun doing the progressive era a generation earlier. So there's lots of ways to do it. And, and again, and, and do we need more higher taxes on people like me and probably you and those of us, a lot of people watching? Yes, of course we do, because we have plenty. And 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 I, I think if if you're a if you're a fair-minded person and you're not utterly committed to just me, 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 me about all things economically, people will come to understand that yeah, this this isn't this isn't working. And and by the way, it works a lot better in all these ways in other countries. I mean, the fact that having universal health care is is so has been made so contentious is also crazy because tell, show me just to, for starters, show me how it works better here than it does in all these other rich countries that, by the way, and, and one of the things I hated about the democratic primary process and the arguments about healthcare and how it, how it should be dealt with was, there isn't just one way that Denmark, Germany, Canada, Australia, France, Japan, all these other countries do it. They do it in a whole bunch of different ways with different versions of private and public, and but it's universal and nobody goes broke paying for healthcare. So, so I mean, that there's a reason that became the central how do we fix this mess uh, question in the in the democratic uh, primaries and in this election? But but it's that that is an obvious beginning. But it's all these ways in which just the the basic security that that people did feel Americans had and felt when I was a kid and and that my parents felt coming out of the war. We need to figure out ways to restore that in this very new situation where you know, with, with AI and all the, re and, and AI and, and globalization that make, make all the, the problems very different than they were 70 years ago. So do you think, and this is an audience question, do you think the extreme views that we're seeing reflected in our politics today are the result of, you know, our leaders driving us in that direction or a reflection of the way our culture has become divided? Well, it's both. There's a lot of chicken and egg problems in this that I talked about in Evil Geniuses. I think, um, and and you know, I mean, uh, th th there are conspiracy theorists on both sides. There are extreme views on both sides. All everything is true on both sides, but it's asymmetrical. It's insanely more true on the right. Now, why did that happen? That happened because the rational, smart, evil geniuses in 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 politics and finance and C suites and the rest. Uh, understood that to get what they needed to do done in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, they needed to have, uh, you know, not, not enough people to get elected. And who are those people going to be? There aren't enough rich people and CEOs to form a party. So you need a bunch of people who uh, are not rational or, or not educated or not whatever. And how do you get them? Well, you get them by riling them up and making them afraid of everything and everybody. And that leads inevitably, has led in this country, which by the way, of course, has a certain history of toxic racism and bigotry, to extreme toxic political feelings. And, 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 and I think at, at what may be the end of this long 50 year cycle, that came after this other long 50 year New Deal cycle, that in the desperation to hold on to power, uh, the right in the form of the Republican Party has, has uh, given, unleashed the extremism on their side to, to this 
a horrible and and ultimately, I believe, self destructive, self destructive both of the of the Republican Party, and if it if it's allowed to go unchecked, America that this this self destructive way. So we have another audience question that I think is interesting because you talk about some of these themes in the book. Uh, they talk about a book that's titled Fairness and Freedom, and it basically compares the evolution of the United States and New Zealand, which were uh, two open societies that were founded by British colonists. And it basically talks about how New Zealand adopted an approach from an early stage of, of that country's life uh, around the collective good, whereas the United States was more about libertarian individualism. And we've seen those two different approaches you know, achieve success in each country, the United States and our philosophy around individualism has certainly uh, been part of the economic miracle here, but at certain times it's also been a detriment to us. One of which you could talk about is COVID. Uh, you know, you see New Zealand has zero cases while the West Wing has you know, 37 and counting. So, you know, what do you think uh, has created that environment? Do we need a reset of, you know, that brand of ind individualism that's, you know, become a sort of our trademark in the United States. You talk a little bit about how China maintained some of its political system while resetting, you know, their uh, their economic system as well. So how do we yeah. find more of that balance? Yeah, well, I do, I do talk about China and what they did in the late seventies, and 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 I think where we are now requires perhaps as as significant and 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 radical of a change as they did. It it worked out well for them, didn't it? Um, the, the individualism thing is interesting. That's a real thing, right? That's a real thing in the founding of the, of, of, of the United States. It was, and then became this mythologized real thing as well. But we also had this intense sense of community, even back in the 19th century, the height of cowboys and settlers and all that kind of in, mythic individualism, small towns and it became this 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 sustaining place where people helped everyone. Then, when we got big corporations and bigger population and bigger government and everything else, uh, we 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 used governments, local and and federal, and used unions and used all these non individualistic means to balance out the individualism, to make sure that there was a sense of the, the common good and, 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 and the common. So, you know, yes, we have this in our system and it will always affect and people want to be who they want to be. And that's, and that's been great and grand and beautiful in American history. But my, my argument, my, my theory of the case is that starting around 1970, that just got out of control. It just got out of control uh, and was was privileged over everything else. And for these Milton Friedmanites, who you know are, are a major part of my evil geniuses, they used that to uh, uh, you know help themselves and and kept helping themselves. So so you know it was always there, but it was always there in balance with this sense of we are Americans together. We we help each other and all that, and then, uh, you know, it, 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 I say it's like a a chronic condition <laughs> that that sort of was fine, and 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 to be in the bloodstream until it was allowed to kind of just metastasize out of control, which I think is what's happened. Well, Kurt, thanks so much for joining us. I think we could talk for three hours, uh, no problem about these themes because they're the big themes that you know, we're facing as a country today, and and hopefully we can have you back on in a few months. Uh, when maybe the landscape is a little bit different, we can talk about some of these energetic government policies that hopefully can help lift us out of the, the current predicament. Anthony, you I have any to, final I words? Need to know where your, I need to know what your next book is, Kurt, so I can start investing in that direction. Okay, you, uh, you I'll, clear, I'll, I'll, as soon as, 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 soon as I know, I'll let so, you know. All right, well, exactly right. Well, thank you so much, Kurt. We, we appreciate it. Hopefully we can get you to uh, one of our live events at some point. I think you would enjoy that. And I love it. Enjoy the chemistry there. Thanks. All the best to you, Kurt. See ya.